Okay, today is Saturday, uh, the Vigil of Pentecost. The epistle is from the Acts of the Apostles. In those days it came to pass, <clears throat> while Apollo was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and found certain disciples, and he said to them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? But they said to him, We have not heard so much as we have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. And he said, And what then were you baptized? He said, In John's baptism. Then Paul said, John baptized the people with the baptism of, bap of penance, saying that they should believe in him who was to come after him, that is to say, in Jesus. Having heard these things, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had imposed his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And entering the synagogue, he spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and exhorting concerning the kingdom of God. King of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he shall give you another paraclete, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth, seeth him not, nor knoweth him. But you shall know him, because he shall abide with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me, because I live, and you shall live. In that day you shall know that I am in the, my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. And Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. A Maria Gracia Plena Domus Tecum, Benedicta Toribus, and Benedictus Fructus Svantes to Jesus. Sancta Maria Mater Dei, Ora Pro Perfecto, Ora Pro Perfecto, Ora Pro Perfecto, Ora Pro Perfecto, On this vigil of Pentecost, we will examine briefly why the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth, is not the same as the Spirit of Vatican II. And for most of us here, this should be a review. As Pope Pius XII says in Humanae Generis, truth cannot change from day to day. And Pope Leo XIII adds to this discussion, the history of all past ages is witness that the, the Apostolic See has constantly adhered to the same doctrine and conveying a diff very different message than Vatican II. The First Vatican Council says that the Holy Ghost was, as was not promised to the successors of Peter for them to make a new doctrine known by revelation but for them to maintain a hold in a holy way and to expose faithfully by his assistance the revelations transmitted by the apostles, that is, the deposit of faith. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself speaks to us of the present day crisis or the, the apostasy that we live in today. I know that after my departure, raven wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. The apostles exhort us, therefore, to take care of, to keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding the profane novelties of words and the oppositions of knowledge falsely so called. 1 Timothy 6.20 verses. And later on, 2 Timothy 4.3 warns us, For there shall be a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. And 2 John 1.9 says, Everyone who receiveth and continueth not in the doctrine of Christ, 
hath not God. He that continueth in the doctrine, he hath both the Father and the Son. First of all, let us show how one pope after another before Vatican II has stated and restated the Magisterium's insistence on rejecting novelty and innovation and clinging to tradition, along with its insistence on the complete impossibility that the Magisterium could ever contradict itself, the other impossibility that what the Church has taught in the past can suddenly no longer be held as true in the present. This is impossible. Secondly, we'll show that that Catholic who holds fast to the church tradition, that is sacred and divine tradition, as opposed to mere human traditions, has his feet firmly planted on the only solid foundation. It will become more and more evident as we call upon the Supreme Pontiffs to speak in their official capacity as figures of Christ, when you look at their quotations before Vatican II. And thirdly, by magisterial teaching and its condemnation of the modern errors, it will become clear that the Second Vatican Council already stood condemned by the popes, even before it was convened by John XXIII. As also the submersive reforms of the past 50 years that have been perpetuated in the spirit of, of this now truly infamous council. First of all, let's look at what is, what is the magisterium and Catholic doctrine. According to Catholic Encyclopedia, the magisterium is defined as follows, as the official church's official teaching authority and office. Together with the sacred scripture and holy tradition, the magisterium is one of the three means whereby divine revelation is infallibly transmitted to men. In St. Matthew 16, 18, we find the scriptural basis of the mission assigned to the church by our Lord, to teach divinely revealed truth and to safeguard maintain and pass on the whole deposit of faith. Quote, and I say to thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give to thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth, it shall be bound also in heaven. And this biblical reference pertains to the church's teaching office, its magisterium, given its commission and authority, and we can see by our Lord himself. One of the principal expressions of this teaching authority comes to us by way of papal communications and pronouncements or other statements. The encyclical letters are one such means of communication of magisterial teaching. These letters are, that are mostly intended for the whole church and only occasionally directed at local churches, that is to say, the church in one particular country, are usually expressions of the magisterium's ordinary rather than extraordinary teaching office. Nevertheless, they must be believed and adhered to inasmuch as they uphold and do not go counter to that which the apostles, the popes, and the church have taught continuously and without alteration or interruption down through the centuries. That is, for the last 20 centuries, to be exact. The First Vatican Council, which was a dogmatic and not a pastoral council as Vatican II, states it in these words, quote, by divine and Catholic faith, all those things must be believed which are contained in the written word of God and in tradition and those which are proposed by the church, either in a solemn pronouncement or in, or in her ordinary and universal teaching power, to be believed as divinely revealed." End of quote. Pope Leo XIII sheds further light on this subject. Quote, Christ instituted in the church a living, authoritative, and permanent magisterium which he strengthened by his own power, taught by the spirit of truth, and confirmed by miracles. He willed and ordered, under the gravest penalties, that its teachings should be received as if they were his own. 
As often, therefore, as it, it is declared on the authority of this teaching, that this or that is contained in the deposit of faith, divine revelation, it must be believed by everyone as true. If it could in any way be false, an evident contradiction follows. For then God himself will be the author of error. End of quote. And of course, for God to be in error or to contradict himself is a sheer impossibility. That's what Pope Leo XIII is implying by that last sentence. Pope Pius XII was even more clear when he said, quote, Nor must it be thought that what is expounded in exegetical letters do not of itself demand consent, since in writing such letters the popes do not exercise the supreme power of their teaching authority. For these matters are taught with the ordinary teaching authority, of which it is true to say, from St. Luke 10, 16, Here that heareth you, heareth me. And generally what is expounded and inculcated in exical letters already for other reasons appertains to Catholic, Catholic doctrine. And a quote from Humani Generis, Pope Pius XII. Therefore, the Church leaves no room for doubt or uncertainty. In this, we plainly see that even ordinary magisterial teaching carries a great deal of weight when it, when it reiterates and reinforces Catholic doctrine and hence directs the intellects of men to the truth of the faith. The human intellect was meant not for error, but for truth. Just as human liberty was meant not for evil, but for good. On the gravity of the dying revealed truth, Pope Leo XIII writes the following. To reject dogma is simply to, to deny Christianity. Just as it is, it is height of misfortune to go astray from the way, so is it to abandon the truth. Wherefore, if the truth be sought, by the human intellect, it must first of all submit it to Jesus Christ and securely rest upon his teaching, since therein truth itself bespeaks. End of quote. Pope, Pi, Pope Leo XIII. Unlike Vatican I, Vatican II left itself extremely vulnerable to error. For one reason, because it chose not to assume a dogmatic character and impetus, as most of the other church councils have done, but instead a pastoral one only, which is not protected by the, divine, the same divine favor. The church's additional shortcoming is that it chose to disregard tradition in its misguided eagerness for the forbidden fruits of novelty, innovation, and acceptance by the impious and impious unbelieving world. And the fathers of this wicked council, of, of the Second Vatican Council, chose to satisfy fallen man rather than please the Lord God himself. Let us consider then what the First Vatican Council put forth. Since being fully dogmatic, it is absolutely binding on all Catholics. It said the doctrine of faith that God has revealed was not proposed to the minds of men as a philosophy, sorry, as a philo philo philosophical discovery to be perfected, but as the divine deposit entrusted to the spouse of Christ that she might faithfully keep it and infallibly define it. Consequently, the meaning of the sacred dogmas, which must always be preserved, is that which our Holy Mother, the Church, has determined. Never is it permissible to depart from this, from this in the name of a deeper understanding. This quotation from the Dogmatic Constitution, De Ecclesia Dei in Critium. Again, another quotation from Vatican I says, The Holy Ghost was not promised to the successors of Peter for them to make a new doctrine known by revelation, 
But for them to maintain in a holy way and to expose faithfully by his assistance the revelation transmitted by the apostles, that is, the deposit of faith. And a quote from the same source. And just repeat what we said at the beginning, Pope Pius XII, truth cannot change from day to day. Leader 13 adds the, to this, the history of all past ages is witness that the apostolic see has constantly adhered to the same doctrine. So we see that it is quite impossible for the magisterium to deviate from one iota from its divinely commissioned function of firmly holding fast to the zealously perpetuate, perpetuating Catholic doctrine. To deviate from Catholic doctrine would be to betray the very purpose and mission assigned it by God. To do so would be to betray the blessed Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And has always been the church's, church's unshaken conviction that when the magisterium speaks on a given matter, either in its extraordinary or ordinary capacity, the debate is over. The matter is settled. Let's now look at some of the encyclicals that, what that, that they have to say and compare them to what is happening today. Let's go back to St. Pius X and what he said on modernism. Pope St. Pius X rendered a great and valuable service to the Catholic cause in producing his encyclical Pascendi Dominici Gregis on the doctrines of the modernists in 1907. He received that the liberals, who have today gained the upper hand in the church and continue to militate against Catholic tradition, are not altruistic idealists with sincere and noble aspirations. They know what they're doing. Rather, their do terrible doctrine is to quote the Holy Father, Pius X, a most pernicious doctrine, and which is made not for edification, but for destruction. Not for the making of Catholics, but for the seduction of those who are Catholics into heresy, and tending to the utter submer subversion of all religion. And the quote from the great Pius, St. Pius X. And continuing the quotation, Pope Pius X says, And hearing these things, speaking of the errors of modernism, we shudder indeed at so great an audacity of assertion and so great a sacrilege. In the same papal document, Pope Pius X restates the basic, basic duty of the magisterium when he said, One of the primary obligations assigned by Christ to the office divinely committed to us of feeding the Lord's flock is that of guarding with the greatest vigilance the deposit of faith delivered to the saints and rejecting profane novelties. End of quote. And in this papal masterpiece in defense of the faith, St. Pius X launches an all-out offensive strike against the modernists who have declared an all-out war against Roman Catholicism by seeking to undermine and eradicate its traditional doctrines by seeking to do away with doctrine altogether. Nor would we be wrong, the Pope continues, to regard these modernists, quote, as the most pernicious of all the adversaries of the church. For they put into operation their designs for her under undoing, not from without, but from within. End of quote. And that certainly makes them all the more dangerous because they appear as good Catholics, right? Dressed in cassocks and so on. That we have to obey them. Very briefly, the saints survey of some of the errors of the modernists that have so relentlessly permeated the thinking of the left 
leading bishops, theologians, intellectuals, and clergymen have to do with the following. First point, agnosticism. What does that mean? Claiming in essence that science and history must be atheistic. That religion oversteps its legitimate bounds if it attempts to impose itself in, these, in those fields. And that phenomena substitutes for divine revelation. That's the basic meaning of Gnosticism. Secondly, vital eminence. <clears throat> Asserting that only in man and in his life's experience can we find the explanation of religion. This reduces divine revelation and true religion to an experience or a sentiment or a feeling. And we certainly see these false ideas as the prevailing attitudes in our day among the Norse Order Catholics. The third point, the vari variability of dogma. Modernists insanely believe in the intrinsic evolution of dogma. Because human experience, consciousness, and sentiments are variable frere, where from dogma takes its origin, according to the modernist mentality, dogma too, or also must be necessarily evolved, according to right, their thinking. And here's one conclusion found in the book, A Catechism of Modernism, based on St. Pius X's encyclical of Ascendi. Quote, feeling no horror at treading in the footsteps of Luther, they're accustomed to display a certain contempt for Catholic doctrines as well as for the Holy Fathers, and for the Ecumenical Councils, and for the Ecclesiastical Magisterium. And should they be rebuked for this, they complain that they are being deprived of their liberty. End of quote. And is, of course, a false liberty that presumes to call into question the very truths revealed by God and taught and passed down by the Church of God. The Catechism of Modernism continues as follows, not another the quotation, the modernists pervert the eternal concept of truth. And then quotes Pope Gregory XVI when it says, quote, they, that is the modernists, are seen to be under the sway of a blind and unchecked passion for novelty, thinking not, not at all of finding some solid foundation of truth but despising the holy and apostolic traditions. They embrace other vain, futile, uncertain doctrines condemned by the church, on which in the height of their vanity, they think they can rest and maintain truth itself." End of quote. And one more example of showing that the spirit of Vatican II is not the spirit of truth, coming from the Holy Ghost, is the corruption of the liturgy. Modernism went on to seep its poison into the veins of the liturgical movement until it eventually succeeded after the death of Pope Pius XII in actually mutilating the Catholic liturgy. We may nevertheless be grateful that Pius XII had been steadily vigilant during his pontificate for he has left us another invaluable document before he died, and this one in defense of the traditional Catholic liturgy and reputation of the prostituted liturgy that has been profaned our worship through the Norse Ordo Mass, desecrated our sanctuaries, and committed unspeakable sacrileges against the Holy Sacrifice itself. Through Pius XII's letter on the Sacred Liturgy of November 1947, Mastery once more exercised its authority in asserting that the liturgy includes both divine and human elements. That divine elements, instituted as they have been by God, cannot be changed in any way by men, such as, for example, the sacrificial nature and essence of a Holy Mass. As we know, the more recent understandings presume to betray the divine, that is, the Novus Ordo's, Novus Ordo idea. They portray the divine sacrifice of the altar as a memorial meal, or as a mere commemoration of our Lord's supreme sacrifice, 
emphasizing the Last Supper while diminishing Calvary and the cross. This is just one reason why, for example, Cardinal Ottaviani said that the new Mass was more Protestant than Catholic. Continuing with Popeye's 12th encyclical on the sacred liturgy, he points out the following, that the human components of the liturgy may, under certain circumstances, be modified and undergo some changes, quote, as the needs of the age, circumstance, and the good of souls may require, and as the ecclesiastical hierarchy, under guidance of the Holy Ghost, may have authorized, end of quote. But such changes can be acceptable only, only insofar as the integrity of Catholic doctrine is maintained. It's quite obvious that the integrity of Catholic doctrine has not been maintained in a new Mass. Again, listen to the Pope's own words in his encyclical Miator Dei on the Sacred Liturgy. Quote, it has pained us, it has pained us grievously to note that such innovations are actually being introduced. Remember, he said that in 1947. Not merely in minor details, but in matters of major importance as well. We instance in point of fact that those who make use of the vernacular in the celebration of the August Eucharistic sacrifice also, those who transfer certain feast days, which have been appointed and established under mature deliberation to other dates, and those who finally who delete from the prayer books approved for public use the sacred texts of the Old Testament, deeming them, them little suited and inopportune for modern times. End of quote. So he knew that the modernists were in action already back in the 1940s, attacking the sacred liturgy. Well, Pius XII goes on to say, quote, the use of the Latin language, customary in a considerable portion of the church, is a manifest and beautiful sign of unity, as well as an effective antidote for any corruption of doctrinal truth, end of quote. Therefore, Catholics today really prefer Latin not only because it is beautiful and sacred and the official language of the Universal Church, but chiefly because it is a guarantee, a guarantee of doctrinal integrity, a most potent safeguard against doctrinal corruption. And finally, the Pope but as Pope Pius Pope, 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 XII comments further on the modern preference for the ancient rites of worship, when he says, quote, Assuredly, it is a wise and most laudable thing to return in spirit and affection to the sources of the sacred liturgy. But it is neither wise nor laudable to reduce everything to antiquity by every possible device. Thus, to cite some instances, one sh would be straying from the straight path were he to wish the altar restored to its primitive table form, for example. Or were he to want to want black excluded as a color from the liturgical vestments. Or were he to forbid the use of sacred images and statues in churches? Or were he to order the crucifix so designed that the Divine Redeemer's body shows no trace of his cruel sufferings? End of quote. All these liturgical initiatives, strongly denounced by the Magisterium, can of course be easily recognized in the services found in those order parishes today. You see them all around. And that's one main reason why faithful Catholics are sever severing their ties to the diocesan parishes and more and more flocking to other traditional mass centers 
just as the faithful did during the time of the great Saint Athanasius back in the fourth century under his urging to leave the churches and go somewhere else for the holy sacrifice and your worship of God during the Arian crisis. There are examples to show why the spirit of Vatican II is not the spirit of truth, but we'll end here today. Therefore, on this vigil of Pentecost, let us beg the intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the spouse of the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth, to inspire the truth, the true truth, the real truth, into disillusioned Catholics who currently believe and act according to the evil spirit of Vatican II. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.